Thanks for tuning in to the Black Sunday podcast. I'm your host, Ian Wilson, a writer and musician and all-round horror fanatic from Fife, Scotland. Joining me on the podcast is Kevin Grosset, a filmmaker and self-proclaimed cinema fanboy living in Edinburgh. So without further ado, dim the lights, pop the lid off your favourite tub of ice cream, and hold on to your loved ones. The dissection is about to commence. Welcome everybody to episode 6 of the Black Sunday Podcast. This month we're discussing Possession from 1981. Um, the story is about a woman who starts exhibiting increasingly disturbing behaviour after asking her husband for a divorce. Suspicions of infidelity soon give way to something much more sinister. Bit of an understatement. <laughs> I yeah, I was going to say, you can say that again. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, I went and like well, was... I basically, after watching this film, decided, you know, there was a couple of things that I was wondering what exactly was going on. So I went on to Google just to, you know, see if there was any answers to at least a couple of them. And basically the first thing I saw was a guy saying, if you've come here trying to look for answers to this film, then don't bother. <laughs> you know, oh. it's, just, it's just, you have, it's one of those films where you just have to basically take what you can from the film there's nothing actually definitive that uh, actually happens in it so um nothing to ones. see here basically yeah pretty much just whatever you think i sure make your own assumptions about what's actually going on um i mean i thought there was going to be a wee bit more of a story but i mean it quickly goes off the rails <laughs> when you think that's what's going to go on um again another film that went into totally blind were you the same yeah uh, well Mm, not exactly. I had seen the um, subway sequence before. All oh, right, I hadn't seen that, and I wasn't expecting this. <laughs> so I will definitely. I'm, talk I'm about not sure that how one. anyone would expect it. I mean, the way it goes down's yeah, quite uh, yeah. original. Yeah, totally, man. Uh, I guess we'll speak about that as well. Um, so this film, I mean, you could go into the actors and all sorts of things too, but really the two main ones would be um, Sam Neill and. Um, the woman, I uh, forgot, man, I've not got her name written down here. Do you know it off, offhand? Isabel Ajani. Yeah, that's the one. I do apologise for that. I'm if she's listening, we're, we're so sorry, Isabel. And she's way better than Sam Neill, isn't it, for sure, man, for that performance. Although both of them, um, yeah, they both, both of them gave it 110%, that's for sure. Um, there's a few other actors, obviously, we can speak about as well. But basically, the real stars are them, the two of them, everything that's going down. Um, interesting with Sam Neill as well, eh? That, um, you know, I guess you would be a little bit like me, where your first, you know, taste of this guy was probably Jurassic Park, and then you get a little bit older and see that he's actually quite um, well acquainted with horror films, like or he's in things like this and the th Omen, uh, part of the Omen um, movies and Event Horizon and Daybreakers, and he did a couple of other things as well, um, like was it Mouth of, Mouth of Madness or in the Mouth of Madness or something like that. So I like to imagine Sterling. that this is a sort of prequel to Jurassic Park. This was the early years of Dr. Alan Grant. <laughs> yeah. It would be good to put that, man. Put it that together. That's why yeah, he was so be. jaded. Yeah, totally. Need to get away from society. Um, <laughs> yeah, so the the film as well, when I, I, mean, I mean, this is, again, with us going down this sort of foreign, I guess the foreign market a wee bit here, or highbrow cinema. Polish director. Uh, Aye, the Polish director. So his name is Andrzej Zolowski. Is that right? Or Zolowski? Andrzej Z Zolowski, I believe. Z Zolowski. Um, yeah, I was doing a little bit of info. Try to get a wee bit of info on him as well, just in case, you know, there was any glaring omissions of films he's done, like I did last time with Catherine Bigelow and Point Break. But um, I didn't. I, I, it seems like this is his main film. This is like the one that everybody knows him for kind of thing. Is that right? Yeah, this was his blockbuster. Yeah, um, and I saw that he said the guy doesn't seem very happy with uh, modern film, 
because he says the only progress in film nowadays is in technology. Technology leads the industry. You have three solutions, and in between, once every five or six years, you can see a film, which is a film, which is something to see, to hear, to get moved by in a way or another. I'm still very much against contemporary cinema. What can we do? Uh, interesting. So, so, um, so that so that's a quote from the man. <laughs> yeah, it reminds me of a quote from Spielberg, who I'll talk about a bit later. I think there's a sort of Spielberg theme that's going to run throughout this. But he said yeah. something about how his generation of filmmakers were the last ones who were truly influenced just by cinema. You know, mm -hmm. because I guess when they were young, TV was quite new still. And the generations after them were influenced by TV, you know, things like, well, MTV, music videos, things like that. And he referred to the next generation as the technocrats. Oh, yeah. <laughs> nice one, man. Wait, so it yeah. sounds like he's kind of thinking along the same lines as Andre. Yeah, definitely, man. And you can totally see that as well. Um, I think that, and it is, I think we've spoken about this in the past as well, where sometimes you get all the CGI that kind of, it's more focused on the visuals with stuff that is on like computers and stuff rather than you get the stories. And I don't think, I don't see a film like this really being made nowadays, you know, with the money involved in it, um, you know, putting into the, the budget for it getting made and things like that. It'd be a hell of a chance, like, and probably I suspect that the the way that this one went down at the time, although again, like most of the films we talk about that have become these cult, you know, cult classics, didn't really make a big splash. I think it lost quite a bit of money um, to begin with at the box office. I think anyway, because it's hard to find out quite a bit of um, quite a bit of inf information about it. I think the budget was around about two and a half million dollars, um, and it seemed to return about a million. But the only thing I saw was it said it was in the US, which confused me slightly as well because it seemed to be banned absolutely everywhere, <laughs> which uh, we can talk about as well, I suppose, because that's um, yeah a bit of information there. Yeah, uh, I think the film would a film like this would be a gamble in any era. I mean, I'm not sure who was expecting a massive return on investment for something like this because I guess the the audience would always be fairly niche. Yeah, definitely, man. Although it's, you, I mean, watching it as well, I'm sure you were exactly the same as me, where you pick up where there was like influence maybe from um, some directors like came afterwards, certainly where this guy's maybe taken a little bit of inspiration from as well uh, in it. So maybe at, at the time, I suppose as well, um, as we'll discuss, probably was a couple of directors that he was maybe thinking, well, we're going to, this maybe pointed to them for reference about what he was going to try and do and maybe they were a success. So um, yeah, but I mean, the information I really got about this, that sort of production-wise as well, that um, they'd done it in 12 weeks. Yeah. Um, so is that quite fairly normal for for a movie? Mm, it's probably actually quite a long schedule for something like this, because if you think about it, it's got a very... Um, not many locations. Sort of. Yeah, not that many locations. Um, obviously, the scenes are lit, but it's quite a naturalistic lighting style, things like that. It's not a huge cast. Um, yeah. I think the reason for the extended schedule is probably because of some of those action sequences towards the end. Yeah, totally. Um, I saw the thing is I, I liked it right at the start, kind of you know the whole vibe with Berlin and stuff because it just has that, and particularly in the eighties with the Berlin Wall and stuff, where it has that, you know, the vibe. <laughs> it's just sort of that. Uh, not, Impressive. Not, it's, it's, yeah, exactly. Um, and then I, I read a thing that he was saying that he chose Berlin as a setting uh, for the story just because of its proximity to the. The communist world right um so most of the film was shot next to the wall as well uh, in west berlin um and it said that the surrealist cl clean quality that he was looking for uh, was aided by a steady cam work of camera operated uh, sorry camera operator uh, same first name and andrej Yaroswitch Serovich. <laughs> Man, I can't believe this. It's okay. So bad, so bad. If any Polish people you. are listening, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Yaros. <laughs> I don't know why I can't get my tongue around the name, man. And the cinematographer as well, which was Bruno Neuten. I yeah. think he actually ended up um, marrying the, the lassie that's the main star of it as well. Eh? Whose name you um, also forgot. Isabella yeah. Johnny. Sorry, Isabel. Y yeah. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, but. Yeah, I mean, the, the, it, it said it was, um, uh, from the start of it, I guess, just a bit of like, like, 
I felt pretty optimistic watching it just from that, like you're saying with the oppressive thing with it being shot in, in Berlin and how arty it was kind of looking and stuff. Just with the wall being up there too, because I, I don't know, has there been, I can't think of many films where they've actually filmed in Berlin when the wall was still standing. Can you think of anything like that? Or not really? You know, it's um, just that kind of the no, vibe with really. Just a bit like grey and grim, you know what I mean? Like sort of heavy melodrama kind of thing going on. I guess art house right is that <laughs> what you would just describe it as yeah i guess so um yeah the, there aren't many um let's say sunny days there are a couple of sunny day shots towards the end but it's mostly kind of this overcast bleak dark concrete atmosphere. yeah <laughs> yeah um they picked up pretty quick as well with this film that everything's either quite calm and understated or it's intense as fuck you know what I mean so it's like even yeah. there's like there's certain things that are going on in the film where um, you think like with Sam Neill particularly at the beginning you're like this guy's chilled do you know what I mean like everything that's going on is the world's getting turned upside down he's taking it pretty well but then quickly um, he goes to the completely opposite <laughs> other side of things there um, some of the I was going to say some of the you know the kind of um, influence I suppose that you could say it'd be easy like sort of parallels in it from like someone like David Lynch you know, and um, and David Cronenberg and stuff as well. I don't know if that was kind of the things where you maybe think he's pointing, saying that the stuff he was going to try and do, and uh, particularly like a razor head and things, just with like you know the the fucked up nature of the things that you see in the film later on, um, and then maybe something like you know again with the 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 the, the thing that's in this film, um, is maybe sort of uh, inspiration for someone like Clive Barker when he was doing like Hellraiser or something like that as well, um. I would imagine. Yeah, maybe kind of an early body horror film. Yeah, it's it's just and I, and as I say, it was weird because the film we were saying going in like blind to it. I wasn't expecting it um, to go the way that it did. Just, I mean, and even the, the way it was leading at the time, because I didn't know what to expect. But the way the film starts and everything's going down, it's like you quickly kind of realise like, okay, this is pretty mental. Uh, but then it starts to it takes so many like, kind of like twists. You know what I mean? As it goes, um, so it was really. Yeah, it was unexpected, but I mean, enjoyable as well, because uh, it's not it's not something that keeps you guessing. There's just there's nothing to guess at. It's just a case of like just strapping yourself in on the roller coaster and like just <laughs> getting your head filled with it all. Yeah, it's. I don't think it's one of those films where someone could be like, "Oh yeah, I saw it coming." <laughs> yeah, definitely not. Man. Definitely not. Um, what did you make of all the stuff with like did you, anything with like the tone or that the imagery and things as well? Was there anything in there that you really were picking up on? Yeah, there's something interesting about the acting because obviously it comes across as quite over the top and I was trying to think about why it would be that way and I remember an interview with um, Jack Nicholson when he's talking about The Shining and his acting in that, I think is great, you know, it works very well for the world of the film but yep. I think at the time people were criticising it a lot saying it was very like over the top acting, kind of cheesy let's say or chewing the scenery. Um, yeah. But yeah, there's an inf interview with Nicholson where he said that Kubrick wasn't always interested in what feels natural, you know. It's yeah. he was more interested in what's interesting. So like, does you know that's that's better than if it feels real. Yeah, because to be fair, I think in the, the, the in this film, there's probably the reactions in the film, like it was you know, there's not really, it's not real at all. I didn't think at the start I was getting that vibe. Certainly, like I was kind of saying there, where there's there's bits where he's acting completely chilled, where you're like, unex you know, I was thinking nobody would really act like that, or I wouldn't imagine so. And then it totally flips it, and he's going absolutely apeshit crazy, and you're like, well, no one would act, like, nobody would act like that either. So you're totally right there. It's just, but yeah, like interesting, um, just the the whole relationship between them. I know there was a kind of a thing with the film too, um, that there was the whole divide for the director's point of view, um. Well, he was going through a divorce or something at the time when he wrote it. Um, so there's a whole thing where it's maybe his commentary is on like relationships, but also like the political thing as well from um, being in Poland and then in Germany and the divide that was going on there too. Um, so I guess that he's maybe like drawn on that. But in terms of, yeah, just the, the performance wise, I really don't know how he managed to get them to act that way. Apart from in one particular scene, uh, there's some information about the things he said, but... Um, yeah, I don't know how you just go, right, go put a camera on them and get them to give that kind of a performance. Yeah, I guess he was just pushing them to go further or, you know, do less. It's like he's not interested in the middle ground. It's yeah. a complete understatement or a complete overstatement. I'm not sure about this, but um, you know how in the film it 
it makes a point of showing you a lot of the books that are on the shelves and there's things to do with psychology and all this. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking that maybe it's meant to be that the the way they act, it's almost like they're acting out raw emotions, you know what I mean? As if they're sort of giving their subconscious a voice. Oh yeah, that would be. Instead of just, let's say, a normal story where things are sort of suppressed, this is sort of like the subconscious is not suppressed at all and everything just gets expressed. Yeah, yeah, totally, man. All the total raw emotion of it. That's exactly. A, yeah. Really, yeah, totally, man. That's a really interesting take on it. Yeah, the books, I, I I didn't know, like, at the start as well, I thought they were going to, like, just, you know, when he's kind of browsing through the shelves and things too, if there was going to be anything particularly there um, relevant. I th- I did like it where... Um, when he whips out the, the, the he's, he just takes out the book. I don't know how he chooses, how he lands on that book, if there was something I missed there, but then he pulls that postcard out of it that's like, um, Heinrich wrote that note to his wife that says, like, I've seen half of God's face here, the other half is you. What a line, man. <laughs> You're a sending that to somebody. Yeah. I think, was that from like the Taj Mahal or something? Uh, yeah, th- yeah, I think that was where the postcard was from, yeah. But yeah, yeah. I, I don't know where, where the line is from, if it's from... Apparently Dostoevsky's a big influence on um, Solovsky, so it could be yeah. from one of his books, I guess. Yeah, totally. Um, I guess that in those scenes as well, that's where it kind of... You quickly learn that there's this strained relationship between Sam Neill, um, with the, with the two main characters anywhere. There was, a whole, there was a whole thing too at the beginning, you know where he's like getting interviewed? Yeah. Um, and they say like, does our subject still wear pink socks? Because he's like a what? He's basically he's a spy, right? That's his yeah. Job. That's the, yeah, yeah. That's the implication, I think. Yeah. So he's going on this. That was one of the things that I thought you know would maybe play a part in the film because at the end you see the guy with the pink socks that's like coming in. So I'm like, oh shit, maybe I've like, is this guy getting some sort of revenge for spying on him, or you know, is there something like that? But apparently, there's just no clear answer about what that guy's actually doing there at the end of things as well. So. um yeah, yeah kind of... I think the the spy plot. I think it exists because the idea would be that because he's a spy, it's it's like he doesn't know who to trust. So that could be why he's completely paranoid throughout the film. Yeah, I mean, the whole bit when he's like he based you know when he finds out that his wife's been having an affair. There's the whole bit, in fact, where he's he's like in the rocking chair. Oh yeah. Um, there's well actually he's in it a couple of times. I think one part he's like completely calm, but it's it still feels really really sinister where he's like just asking her question after question after question, um, and then then they end up in the yeah in that like the, the the restaurant thing, and then that's when he basically goes from being completely you know chilled to just like absolutely apeshit crazy being restrained by four men including two chefs that are like as he's destroying destroying the restaurant trying to like attack this woman um but then after that was about i was kind of confused because where is he when he's like you know it kind of it kind of cuts to him when he's all like bearded and like you know kind of looking dirty because he's at the start he's like totally clean cut like you might imagine like a spy or whatever sam neil mm. looking shit hot um then he's like yeah, it just like quickly cuts to him. He's all like dirty and bearded and not speaking properly when he's on. It's like he's trying to speak in the phone and he can't talk. And he just looks like he, he's really pale. And then he just, that woman, he's like, ask that woman how long he's been there for. And she says he's been there for three weeks. Yeah, it seems like he took a little trip to a mental hospital. Aye, uh, was that a mental trashing, hospital? I think so. Um, after trashing the cafe. So that cafe is the um, Cafe Einstein in um, Berlin, which was, I believe, the same one that's in Inglorious Bastards, you know, where they have the, the strudel. Oh, really? Yeah. Is that actually a real cafe, or is it just yeah, in, yeah. Cin- in cinema? T- oh, right, it's a nice one, man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, that's cool. I kind of get... Uh, there's actually a bit in this as well, I was going to say, um, but there's one of the characters in it that was like... He comes across like almost identically as as Christoph Waltz does in in that oh, film right, actually, yeah. you know as well, um, in a, 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 and uh, maybe it was in Django or something too. There's just a performance that I was just like, this guy is like surely got to be some sort of an influence on the, on Christoph Waltz, man. You know yeah. what I mean? The way that he comes across. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. The last thing I want to say about the the cafe was um, I thought it was interesting how when she walked into the restaurant, you think maybe she's going to sit across from him, but she sits, so yeah. she's kind of got her back to him. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of like interesting. Yeah, it's really interesting. 
And then, yeah, oh yeah, and I found it really funny when all the chefs piled on Sam Neill as well. Yeah, man. It's unexpected. That's what I mean. That's really when the point in the film where it's just like, because that's before I was like, nah, this guy's he's acting way too calm. But then there's like a saying when he was in the rocking chair, it's like, well, he, he's quite sinister in how, how calm he is. And then that comes, and then, yeah, you get them. There's a couple of little comedic moments, I guess, maybe. But... Yeah, I think the thing that makes the rocking chair sinister is that he's rocking at quite an intense pace whilst delivering, you know, yeah. the calm dialogue. So maybe that's another sort of hint of what's going on in his subconscious versus... Well, he, he does it again. Above. I think I think he's in um, the bit... I think there's another bit where he's in that rocking chair, but he's not speaking to her. He's just, like, rocking back and forward, like nearly hitting the floor but his eyes are like totally manic like you know like wide eye like just it's almost like he's got a little smile on his face <laughs> you know what i mean but like a sinister one it's just oh man yeah there's a few times yeah. where the tone kind of shifts um there's a bit where he sets up a character to go to the address where the thing lives and he mm -hmm. just seems quite cheerful about the whole thing you know he's yeah. like oh yeah it's at 180 wherever and then he's just kind of like smiling as he says it. Yeah, Sebastian Strasser or something. I think. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, there's that. Yeah, that bit was. Yeah, that's when it, is that is that the bit where he's like basically saying that he loves the guy that's been having sex with his wife and stuff. There was a kind of a comedic bit with that too, where he's speaking to the guy's mum, eh? And then he's like, um, "Oh, I think I can tell your son I, I love him or something like that." She's like, "Well, you can speak to him." It's like, "No, no, I don't want to speak to him." But it's just like the way he like, delivers the line and stuff as well. Yeah, it's maybe like... we should talk about that character then now, Heinrich, because he's yeah. he's kind of interesting. Yeah, he's like the third, I would say, the third sort of main character that's in it. That's, and he's definitely interesting. The whole thing with him, so he's the guy that's like having an affair with his wife. His wife's called Anna, right, in the film? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and just, but like, their, their whole relationship even between like sam neil's character and him it's weird the way that one kind of develops as well because even again where it's like he confronts some you know about basically having an affair with his wife but in a kind of chilled way and then it then it goes oh i don't know there's just heinrich's I, yeah I, I mean how would you describe this character well i think he's he's portrayed as an intellectual but then you start to get the idea that he's a complete hedonist you know everything's just about the next thrill that he's going to get, whether it's with her or with drugs or something. Yeah. And then there's even bits where it seems like he's coming on to Sam Neill, you know, yeah. and you notice that. So he's like, he just starts touching him in kind of a strange way. And then it yeah. becomes more and more intimate. And it's like, Oh, okay. didn't expect it to take this turn. He also delivers a pretty funny line though. Um, you know, when Sam Neill shows up to confront him and he says something like, don't make me kick this door down. And Heinrich just responds, you don't need to kick it down. It's open. Yeah, 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 man. I did have a little laugh at that one as well. It's the nonchalant of him as well when he says it, eh? He's like oh, yeah. coming out with these kind of lines. Um, I think he's meant to be like Zen or something as well, isn't he? Well, he's, he's, Zen, like... he's Zen until the point he pulls out the martial arts moves. Yeah, yeah, man. That was, uh, again, unexpected. Like basically a judo chop or something like that. It's like, yeah, it's, and it's, it's a move that I didn't think existed, but apparently it does. <laughs> yeah, and effectively too. <laughs> beats oh, yeah. the sh just beats the shit out of Sam Neil. Um yeah, so that, that that was yeah, that was a moment where you kind of I mean again, I mean there's I, I found some of that quite funny as well. I don't know if it was supposed to be particularly funny, but I guess it had to be on some sort of level because it is just absolutely out there, uh, the, whole, the whole the whole scene. Um one of the ones actually of all the films, because obviously with these psychological kind of movies as well, that there's there's obviously supposed to be things that are meant to affect you in certain ways. One of the ones that's probably not that people would look over as well, uh, for me, is the bit where Sam Neill goes back and his son's like being left alone in the house and he's all mm. covered in like food because his mum hasn't come back and stuff like that. So he's got like all the empty jars and stuff on the floor. He's like covered in fucking jam and everything like that. That totally, I, I hate seeing stuff like that, eh? But the interesting thing about that as well is that um, the director um actually returned like when he was in his own uh divorce he returned home um late in the evening and found his own son alone in the apartment and he was smeared with jam because his right. wife because his wife had left him there on his own basically for for several hours so that is directly taken from his real life and and put into the film and stuff as well which maybe mm. does explain that because it didn't need to be in there i suppose as well but um it's, it's probably interesting the way that the guy's taken this uh yeah things from his own breakdown of his marriage or whatever 
Because I think originally um, he just had like 20 pages or something of this script and then he mm. went away to get it made kind of thing. Eh? Yeah. Um, and managed to get himself out and about. Not sure he would have had this end <laughs> goal or whatever his end goal was. I don't know if it would have turned out quite like this, but um, yeah, it's uh, thank goodness it did because it's pretty intense and insane and very memorable for a film. Yeah, I was um, I was reading up on it. You know, it was talking about the fact that it was influenced by his divorce and all that. And people have accused him of misogyny over the years because they've said that it's it's basically like the evil woman has ruined the man's life and all this kind of stuff. But I would have said that neither character is particularly sympathetic. I mean, I don't think you're really on board with the Sam Neill character. After yeah. like, you probably are, he's the first character you see, so I guess we sort of gravitate towards him. But then, I don't think you're really with him, so to speak. Absolutely, I totally agree with you as well. Um, because I found that's one of the things that I found like quite hard. I never got the impression anyway about being misogynistic or anything like that. You tend to find, obviously, that in films it's quite you, you are usually having the person that you're rooting for, or there's something going on there. But there was no clear like between those two characters. It was just there was you were. I think that's part of the reason why I found some of it confusing, uh, and and sometimes quite hard to watch, um, just with it being because it was so confusing, like a tough watch kind of way. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, just because the there isn't that you don't have that connection with the characters there's not a think. protagonist really yeah and it's yeah. kind of interesting the way it switches point of view i remember there was a specific point where it changed to anna's point of view and it was like all right this is kind of interesting now you're seeing her side of things as well is that when she's like looking down the lens and stuff yeah um there's another bit i can't remember if it was actually anna or the doppelganger helen where she's mm. like looking through a fence at sam neil walking away oh yeah yeah, I mean, some of it was like kind of like blurred reality with the, like you're saying, with the doppelganger and stuff too, eh? Because I didn't really understand, um, you know, there was there was bits like where Anna was there and then she was gone mm. and there was no explanation for where she'd went. And then you see that the their son's teacher is her, <laughs> basically, with slightly different hair or different coloured eyes. Um, yeah, I think, and again, it's a psychological thing where it's a projection of an idealized version of anna onto another person yeah that's a beyond me when it comes to these things. well but, i mean uh, i yeah i don't know that much about it either it's just what i gathered it's it's sort of like she's the version that sam neil would prefer her to be sorry yeah, the yeah. name of the sam neil character what's his name again um i wanted to say ben but um it might not be I don't know if I actually made a note of that either, to be honest. Um, um, Mark. Yeah. Mark. What? Okay. Mark, is it? Oh, yeah. I was nowhere near. <laughs> um, yeah, well, just with the, the whole thing with the, the blood reality, there was a whole, you know, there was a bit where there was like, um, when Anna, she storms off, and then it's like she's going to step out in front of a, a truck that's like a car transporter, basically, or whatever, um, and it swerves to miss her, and then the cars come flying off the back, explode and there's like crazy music and stuff like that and she's got like a crazed look on her face and then sam neil just like turns around and starts playing football with, with the like, boys yeah with some like kids that come out yeah hey man at that point i was just like what the, that, like that's only a taster of what was well to come yeah the, the film switched genres within one shot there <laughs> exactly it's just like i didn't know what, i mean i was still at that point i was still trying to be like you know like sometimes we're, we're like, like i've said in the past where i'm trying to pick up on things that might be relevant or whatever um not long after this i kind of gave up on that and just sort of got let it sweep me up and see where it took me like maybe it was just supposed to be that he was running away from his problems and they just wanted to literalize that <laughs> it's like i'll yeah, just have a game of football take your mind off it yeah this car's just flown off the back of a car transporter and exploded and uh <laughs> but the kids don't care you know? they've just like <laughs> come out with their ball that's west berlin they're used to it. all these crazy things back in the happens 80s, every day yeah um yeah there's another thing that was it was as weird um in the sense that it was it was unsettling in the fact that it was just such a distraction when there's even like a bit where he was having a conversation as well with the private investigator and they're swinging on their chairs but it's like you know the chairs are on, they're like going side to side but they're both going oh, yeah. side to side while they're having a conversation. But it's really, you know, it's it's not like a gentle, like natural thing. It's like they're both like totally going 
rapid basically side to side and they're actually having a competition uh, conversation so even watching that man i'm like trying to follow the conversation or whatever and it's just like total, i'm just distracted you know what i mean <laughs> it's just it's, it's intense the whole thing's always intense everything's either so calm or just intense on whatever level um and 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 specifically i think the, the, the when you when you go with the tension you know there's a scene where they're in the ki- kitchen basically having a fight oh yeah and she's like anna's like cutting the meat with an electric knife and then has the mincer i couldn't take that i don't think at that point with the tension that's going on there because i'm like she's like slamming meat into this mincer and stuff and i'm like man she's definitely going to mince her hand or her fingers or something because that's she's what already... i thought as well i thought it was gonna go that way because she's already you know stepped out in front of a you know in front of a truck <laughs> to presumably like you know suicidal and, and not really caring about herself as well so i'm like she's definitely gonna like i didn't know if it was going to be accidental because she was distracted in the, in the fight or she was just gonna you know ram her hand in there but i thought that's what was coming but um it, it wasn't <laughs> you know maybe worse when she like basically takes the the electric knife and uh tries to cut her own throat with it um and then <laughs> Again, with the bizarre nature of things, where Sam Neil after that point starts just sawing into his own arm. Yeah, just a few, Com- few strokes. Just, just nonchalant. Yeah. Why? I mean, why? What do you make of all that kind of thing, though? Because I didn't know what to make of it at that point. Where I was like, "What's actually going on?" I was like, "This is like," and it's only, and and it's it's weird because it's only a sort of, it moves at a pace, but it's still only ramping up. Uh, you know how crazy things are going to be later. Yeah, I don't really know what was going on with the knife, but I think maybe it was that he was trying to feel a connection with her because yeah. their relationship was so toxic at this point that it's like he doesn't even know her anymore. Yeah. So then, so saw- yeah, some sort of <laughs> strange comfort in that sawing in his arm. Yeah. It's not. It's not even like it's a particularly gory scene as you would imagine. Maybe listening if you've not seen the film as well. It's just like you know, maybe the first couple. You know, the first couple that he does. It's only. I thought he's like he's just doing it delicately, like cut his shirt. But then, yeah, then he does it into his arm. <laughs> it's like, oh man. Um, it's actually interesting though the way that that kind of that sort of thing would be maybe um done in more modern cinema as well. You know. Um, yeah, it wouldn't be done in such a sober way. I think. I think it'd yeah. be like really dramatic. Yeah. Totally. Um, and again, that point is kind of that, like we we're kind of talking about, where you're not really relating to, you know, you don't know who you're, whose side you're on or whatever. But there's not really that balance of good and evil, although good and evil does seem to be like quite a, a theme throughout the film, particularly uh, Christianity and religion and stuff, I guess as well. But at this point, it just feels like they're both completely insane, which just really muddies that reality like even more. And just as I say, it's it, it makes it difficult to guess how it's going to go down, and you know it, it there's no way to as we said at the start there's not really any way to guess how it's going to go down no i think things just keep becoming more and more chaotic i, I think it's meant to be that he wants to return from his intense job to a very ordered nice household but he comes back just to face complete chaos which just keeps ramping up all the way through yeah as you say as well the the his, his reaction to things is not really like you would assume a man that would be um in his best health that would be <laughs> trying to think objectively about how to to maybe go back to to win back his wife or, or make it something you know what i mean just every single thing about it is so um overly dramatic or intense um there was a whole bit that kind of confused me as, as well i was confused for probably a lot of them <laughs> um you know like where um anna ends up kind of getting chased through the um, she's on like the train or whatever mm. that was a bit th- that bit was kind of weird too where it's like she's um it's a pri- basically she's getting pursued by the private investigator that's been hired um uh by um by sam neil's character there mark and mark yeah sorry i'll call him mark from now on mark <laughs> um the guy that's the kind of the guy i think that was uh, you know um, maybe it, inspired like christoph waltz or something when he starts to do stuff but it was quite weird the way that he's on the train and then the train's completely empty apart from him and like a homeless sort of alky kind of guy and she chooses to sit next to the the homeless guy like right close to him and then he steals a banana from her or something yeah Um, i thought that was good as well because i was just gonna say it's like she did the thing that you'd expect a woman alone on a train to probably not do you know yeah she could have sat anywhere 
Exactly. It's like she's putting herself in danger, or maybe not danger, but in an uncomfortable situation on purpose. Yeah, man. Because I, I kind of thought at the time that there maybe was some sort of, uh, like, maybe she knew the other guy was on the train, so she just chose to sit right next to this guy, f- even in that situation, for some sort of protection, because then he starts, like, chasing her. But there's no way that she would have known who he was, even though she, like, r- she runs away from him. And he, like, it's, it's a whole bizarre sort of thing where he chases her, and, like, into the house, like, halfway up the stairs to see where she's going or something, eh? And then, then he leaves and gets, <laughs> makes a phone call and stuff. To say he's found her, basically. I think both um, he and his partner are pretty bad private investigators. I mean, they both just seem to fudge it. You know, it's like getting caught by her. I mean, that shouldn't be what happens oh, yeah. with private investigators. I know, but she still doesn't really act as if he is a private. Because he goes back to the house, pretends to be like there to inspect the windows or something. Yeah. Eight. So, and then she's just like, oh, well, you shouldn't really. But he's like, well, I have. That was the bit where I was, I think it was that whole scene when he was checking the windows where it was just like he was coming across with that kind of Christoph Waltz kind of um, vibes. Um, but then, yeah, when it, when it, when he goes into the bathroom. Um, well, I mean, he, he finds think, something. <laughs> finds something, all right. Things take a turn, to say the least, when he goes in there. Um, I didn't really know at the point that what was in the wall. <laughs> So he goes in and, and there's just, there's something in there and it's kind of growing in the wall, but you don't know exactly what it is. And even at that point, I was kind of like, what the, f-? you know what I mean? It was, uh, it was quite hard to, to see what it was or what it was going to be, but there's just something extremely weird. That was the point where I was just like, okay, so maybe this is like some sort of like David Lynch kind of inspiration or something from him. Um, and then the poor guy ends up getting off, getting his throat slit with a wine bottle uh, by Anna. Who, at that point, you're like, all right, so she's into killing folk now. Like, <laughs> Things have taken a so, turn. There's yeah. something in the wall, and she kills. Yeah. yeah. And it's that, especially just with the name of the film, though, too, where it, because it obviously being called Possession and that, I was like, well, it's, is it sort of like what... I think I was kind of still thinking it was going to be one of those things, where it was going to be some sort of demonic entity that was, like, actually physically possessing her or something, which isn't the case. Um, But it's... Yeah, I think after that point... There's a really great scene with um, when Heinrich comes back and that's when he's like, his performance is just insane. He's like rolling on the walls and doing crazy stuff with his hands, but while he's talking quite calm to Sam Neill. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, he's, uh, he's spouting off all this kind of philosophy whilst like looking like he's tripping balls. Yeah, and that's the kind of thing as well where I was like, it kind of reminded me of something that like the Coen brothers would do as well, you know? So I don't right. know if that's another person that might have taken a, a, um, inspiration from that. It just You know, just just how it's so surreal, basically, uh, and, yeah. and not unexpected kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I was going to say about the title as well, because like, I was thinking that about demonic possession, but then it could also be that Mark treats her as a possession. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Um, that, was another, that is kind of the conclusion that I came to. Is it, yeah, exactly that. That basically it was like his possession kind of thing. Um, but it's, yeah, I mean, at that point, still, I don't think it was the point where I'd still given up on um, trying to follow a story of some sort. There was the whole bit um, when the tension, you know, when he goes to, in, like, goes to investigate the, the mystery of the, the missing detective that's been killed there. Um, and that's when you see the thing, which is, I mean, what, is, what would you say it is at that point? An octopus or something? <laughs> we can say an octopus monster, I guess. Yeah, some sort of octopus monster that's basically been shagging Anna. Um, again, I don't know, the, they kind of had the vibes of like a razor head or something. Um, just with the way it looked, basically, I think more than anything else, you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, um, I was trying to figure out why they went for an octopus. Uh, I was doing a bit of research to see if there was any, you know, symbology associated with octopuses, and uh, octopuses is, is apparently the real world word, not octopi, but that that's a whole other thing. All right. Um, so, I was, I was looking at this blog by Emily Rose Lewis, I'm just looking this up here, it says, an octopus spirit is a ruling spirit that is operating in conjunction with and through the arms, which are spirits and sins of the flesh. So. All right. Uh, oh take, really take that as you will yeah no man that's ace that's a good find it totally ties in with uh the whole theme as well eh? with it, when she goes down to like the church and all that kind of stuff 
um, and obviously everything that's going on. Um, I think uh, pretty much around about that scene, it start. I think it was around about that point that it started becoming a bit of a tough watch for me, um, just because of the, you know, I feel find that there was quite a lot of the scenes were like really similar to each other, um, just with the characters being together in their flat or whatever, and then they're in this the whole insanity, just between the two characters or all of the characters really. Um, it just kind of made you sort of, or made me anyway, sort of just give up on a clear story, <laughs> I think, at that point. Yeah, a lot of it just seems to be about the intensity of emotions. There's a bit, I think it's before the fight with the electric knife, it's the previous fight they have, and, you know, the scene's kind of playing out in, like, a wide shot. The camera's mostly always moving in this film, I realise, which kind of adds to the tension, but then it jumps into these giant close-ups of Mark and Anna, I don't know if you remember that bit, and it kind of holds on her face for ages as she's kind of violently sobbing. And yeah. then when it cuts to Mark, he's just giving her this really weird look as if he's saying, who are you? I don't know you. Yeah, yeah. Um, the film uses a lot of really intense close-ups at specific moments, you know? Yeah, man. Um, I was going to say, there's quite a few times where that actually goes on. And, yeah. it's, and, and hers particularly, um, you know, I think the main scene in the film, I mean, the, probably one of the best scenes, maybe is meant to be anyway. From what I've, I try, try to gather from it afterwards, that like in one of the greatest scenes, maybe not greatest in the term that you know you might be thinking, but um, you know, in cinematic history, was what I would call her subway freakout scene, um, where she would be considered maybe completely insane. Yeah, um, yeah, that scene. Uh, I guess you could call that Anna's very bad afternoon. Yeah, man. I saw that was one of the things where I was going to say that the that when it was going on about what the director was actually saying to them, I read that the sole line of direction that she was given there was "fuck the air." Okay. <laughs> and then yeah, um, makes a bit more sense now. So they did it in two takes, or they took they made they did two takes or something like that. Um, just about even because I was thinking, I mean, that was the most memorable scene that because it was so insane, everything that was going on, and it just built up to you know the climax, but even was completely unexpected, and it then kind of took it to like, I mean, we've already seen the weird octopus thing, so you're like, it's not really reality anymore, but it could still, I don't know why with the with the monster, I still was like, maybe it still didn't, it still didn't feel like it was completely insane. At this point, it felt like it went to just complete like another level. Um, so the, the, the whole scene apparently was like filmed at like five o'clock in the morning in the subway um, when it was closed in Berlin. Mm. Um, so the director, I think it was, it must be the director, um, basically said that he knew it was going to be a lot of effort for uh, Johnny, like both emotionally and physically um, because it was cold and he didn't want this. <laughs> he said it was unthinkable to repeat the scene end endlessly. Um, so most of what was actually left on the screen is from the first take and the second one was basically made just as a safety net um, because yeah. it's customary when they're shooting difficult scenes um, in case the lab spoils the material, basically. Yeah, because I um, guess there's not really any cuts. It's, well, there are a couple, but it's mostly just one camera shot. Yeah. Um, yeah, I saw a YouTube comment where it was like, it showed the scene and then it was as if the director was saying, you know, uh, could you do it again, but with a bit more feeling? <laughs> yeah, man. which if you've seen the scene you'd know that's ridiculous yeah man absolutely just i, I mean i i don't yeah it would be hard to imagine how you I, at the time when i was watching it and even with that direction of being like just her only like like fuck the air or whatever it's yeah like, i mean it's a just... scene it's a scene where she goes from like laughing maniacally to screaming like a banshee to smashing up her groceries to having a miscarriage whilst also bleeding from her ears yeah and it's like quite an ask for an actress yeah aye because she's got like some sort of bags of like, like liquid or whatever that must be attached to her that she has to like basically break i guess at the point where it's like she's maybe having a miscarriage and yes yeah, it's coming out her ear. yeah she and would have had like, all the stuff rigged i guess so i was it, thinking it, about how they would have done that yeah um and it's just the way it even looks because it's it's disgusting in a different level way man because it's like it's kind of like not just the blood. I thought the blood actually. Now I'm thinking about it. Um, it kind of looked weird in this film. Like it's it's different all the time, eh? Like with Sam Neill, I think when he gets beaten up, um, by Heinrich, kind of at the start with judo punches or whatever. It's like um, 
kind of brown looking like it didn't look very real i don't know i didn't feel mm. like at that point it was like realistic but this point it's like the blood's like red like coming out from her legs uh, when she's kind of sitting down but it's mm. also got that kind of custardy type shit that's like coming out as well you know what i mean it makes it yeah don't, like, don't even to think about what that would be uh, yeah man so and I, even at the time I, I didn't really understand that she had had a miscarriage even when she says she's had a miscarriage like afterwards she said it's like she doesn't specifically say it. it's like i don't know i can't remember what the exact line is but she yeah the, the thing i miscarried i guess i'm just using the word miscarriage to say what it looks like but yeah i know what you mean i don't think that's actually what's going on there i think it is i think unless maybe not because I, I mean i had a quick look because obviously that was the most memorable scene in the film um I'm sure when I looked in it a couple of things, it was it was kind of called that the like a sort of like the miscarriage kind of thing as well. So I don't know, maybe it was meant to be. And I mean, she keeps having sex with this weird octopus thing, so quite possible. <laughs> like, um, mm-hmm. but Try again. Uh, yeah, <laughs> um, Sa- Sam Neil as well. He also uh, commented on um, the film, basically saying it was the most extreme f- film that he'd ever made in every possible respect, uh, and the <laughs> the things the things that he was the, the director asked of them. Uh, he wouldn't and couldn't go to now and he only thinks he just escaped that film with his sanity barely intact um yeah i think isabella Gianni said that you can only do a film like that when you're young it's like yeah anyone over 30 would probably have a bloody heart attack trying to (laughs) match that performance yeah it was interesting though with sam you saying that that he'd because i think he also said it was his favorite film that he ever did um, or alluded to it, or maybe he did specifically say it. I well, saw it's probably, some, I it's probably saw the best it. one I've seen with him. I mean, no yeah. offense to anyone who's a big Jurassic Park fan, but it's never <laughs> quite clicked for me. But this did. Yeah. Um, but with him saying that he'd only just barely, you know, managed to get with his sanity still intact, um, I, I think that, um, you know, with Anna, it's, yeah, it, she she really did have like a, a breakdown mentally. It took years to like to recover from it. Um, mm. I don't. I'm sure I definitely read that there on, on online as well. Um, yeah, it's probably just but, having to stay in that same kind of manic state of mind for well, as you were saying, twelve weeks. You know, well, that's yeah, crazy. Man. And I think you know everyone always talks about like Shelley Duvall and like The Shining and stuff like that as well. Eh? That it was like how she really had a tough time with like Kubrick and everything and the state that she had to be in. But yeah. if you know, like obviously, I'm, it's quite likely that most people listening to this will have seen The Shining if you take her performance in the shining and this one is like like what 10 times more <laughs> it's extreme the emotions that she's doing like that whole scene that scene particularly i don't even know how you would do it man you know what i mean she must have just went fuck this and went absolutely ape shit crazy to like the full extent of every single emotion she's ever felt in her life with the frustration of the film i guess well, i don't know five yeah. o'clock in the morning berlin subway freezing just like yeah just like right well here we go absolutely going <laughs> just completely ape shit man um, but built up steady it's just oh man it's yeah there's a, probably it's, a bit of amazing. a stunned silence after after she did the first take everyone's just like holy shit well we can't make her do that again <laughs> and then the director's like right take two yeah, take two clean that, clean that shit up off the subway or move a wee bit further up well, let's go yeah it's <laughs> yeah. funny you were making the comparison with Shelley Duvall because there's actually a shot in this that reminded me of, sh- of shot in The Shining with um you know the bit where Shelley Duvall's character interrupts Jack when he's working. And yeah. They have that whole weird, awkward scene where he's like, don't interrupt me when I'm working. Yeah, um, yeah. The close-up of her is really similar to one of um, Anna in this film. Uh, I can't remember exactly which part it's in, though. She had a lot of good close-ups in the film. I need to watch it again, but yeah, I was like, that looks really similar to The Shining. Yeah. I suppose the difference kind of thing as well is that with Anna's character, she goes through the kind of the changes... She had the Val's characters, you know, um, she's like loyal, I guess, to like Jack Nicholson and, and stuff, eh? Whereas in this film with Anna, that she kind of flips a bit where she's like, where she hates, she, she goes on about like how much she hates um, Mark and and then coming back around and she kind of like, it's, it's, it's weird. That's the thing that I found like quite hard about too, because you have those scenes that were, um, where she is basically, they're having in these really, really insane fights and then she's going about how much she hates them and blah, blah, blah. And then like, you know, almost you know like the next day or whatever it's meant to be really quick like takes and then she's just like coming back in with the shopping and stuff like that and it's all like quite calm and stuff as well so it's quite hard um i don't know it's just it's the whole unexpected nature of it and the way that their emotions change quite a lot in the film but again as i said before kind of from completely calm to completely insane um it's just it makes it quite um difficult to kind of it just it keeps you on edge basically throughout the whole film i think because you don't know when they're going to blow their lid <laughs> or something crazy is going to go down yeah, and it's probably because it's 
actually a more realistic way of how things would happen, you know? Things don't usually just boil to a certain point and then that's it. People don't see each other anymore. Well, it can happen that way, but a lot of times people stay in these kind of bad relationships and I mm. guess it's not intense all the time, you know? Yeah, yeah, true. Um, I guess kind of moving on a wee bit too, uh, go back to Heinrich. Um, there's a bit that like when he kind of as well actually you know this is a, i think this was quite an interesting part of the film as well because i was still sort of like not quite sure about the reality of the situation uh, with anna and mark that they could both potentially be both insane or whatever um and then with, with heinrich kind of shows up with his wee bag of drugs um yeah when he, this is like the bit you're on about where, where sam neil basically says where she is so he goes down there on his motorbike acting all slick and that comes with oh, a yeah. bag of drugs to try and basically just get back together with it and he's not taking no for an answer and then he sees the octopus that's now looking slightly more human so that was the point because before i don't you know when the, when the first guy went in the bathroom i'm not really i didn't really pick up on the vibe that he did he say he specifically saw the thing in there or is he not just trying to look at something that's it's all dark you know yeah it's like he's, he's kind of squinting he doesn't quite he knows there's something moving and alive yeah. but it doesn't really yeah can't really see what it is but then this is the point where you see this thing's like as i say it's like becoming more human well, you it's see got, his eyes got, so yeah yeah his eyes and his mouth and it's that kind of weird i mean is it i don't know if it's maybe like an octopus <laughs> mixture of like an octopus is like facing a humans or whatever it's kind of like i think so um yeah and then um that was the point as well where i was kind of like thinking this has got like the hellraiser kind of vibes you know in the attic. oh yeah uh, definitely um, um yeah, it seems like it would have been an influence on that, just how dark they keep the rooms, you know? When yeah, You man. see something kind of wet and red and, yeah, scary. <laughs> yeah. Um, the thing that was totally unexpected about that that scene, uh, for me anyway, was the fact that Heinrich escapes. Yeah, I didn't think, expect that. Because I was like, well, he's done, like, you know what I mean? The same as the guy, there's no way he's getting out. He's seen this thing and he's kind of like... Well, clearly he's asking if it's a joke or whatever, and then not sure, and then he gets stabbed. Um, so yeah, you think that's it, but then she kind of just lets him go. I'm not sure why. <laughs> I don't. Know. The thing comes through to lie on the bed, obviously wanting to have another go or something like that. Eh? But um, yeah, it's just yeah, it was kind of weird how they just kind of let him him toddle off. Um, and it kind of was interesting at that point, where like I felt like Sam Neil like well Mark the relationship between Mark and Heinrich. Um, was quite interesting in the way that it developed because it became at that point as if they were like on the same page like they were friends you know what i mean that they were in it they were both had been sort of betrayed by anna or whatever um and then yeah i was like quickly <laughs> quickly takes a, a a little turn when sam neil kills him in the worst possibly i mean of all the deaths in the film in every film man has that got to be one of the worst deaths the way to go if you could yeah. imagine <laughs> it was pretty um like most of this film pretty unexpected but it was almost like kind of genius in a way that he did it he did it in a way that his hands are completely clean no one's ever going to trace it back to him yeah totally man um so i mean the, the whole bit though as well where it's like uh when he, he goes into like the pub toilet and there's just where does he get that what is that feather where does he did he have like he just reaches up and there's a feather there that was one of the things i don't know if that was <laughs> yeah. some of your folks on obviously use it to make himself sick or whatever yeah but i'm just like where the hell did that feather come from? Just came out of nowhere. He just plucked it out of thin air. <laughs> just plucked out of like a curtain or something. Maybe that's what they were stuffed with. I, I don't know. But yeah, so the, Heinrich's like stabbed and you're obviously thinking that they, he's, it's like he goes there to help him as well and then just, yeah, basically calls him into a, the, the men's cubicle and then smashes him over the head with, a, <laughs> with, the, with the butt of the toilet and then sticks his head down the toilet, which he'd already, which he'd blocked, sorry, didn't he? He blocked it, flushed it, so it was full of water, so he could basically drown him, in it, or let yeah. him, or or let him drown by knocking him. Well, on the yeah, he also vomited just so there'd be a bit of vomit in there as well. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's just oh man, I was just watching at that point. I was just like, I can't actually think of a worse way to die. Being like, <laughs> yeah, it's like almost like the train spot in toilet style. That's what uh, I was thinking. Head first, the, the worst toilet in Berlin. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, is that meant to be a, a famous cafe or pub or something as well that they go to? Because it's actually got a name too, isn't it? Just uh, what you saying before with like that Einstein cafe, I don't know if they were using actual, maybe, mm. maybe not with a murder, maybe with a murder that would be a bit too much to just be like, mm. 
<laughs> to use a real location. <laughs> Just like they've got a plaque up in the bars, like this is where Heinrich was killed in possession. <laughs> in nineteen eighty one. Everyone's just yeah. got in maybe they've got like a dummy set up in there, you know, just like with his head in the toilet. <laughs> 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 So yeah, um, I wanted to um, talk a bit about the creature. Um, so the the creature was designed by Italian special effects artist Carlo Rambaldi, who went on to design E.T. Really? <laughs> so uh, oh, again, a, the, the Spielberg a... connection. So it's like, how do you go from like this film to E.T. within one year? <laughs> yeah, like, you turned like. Yeah, maybe he was just like, after doing this film, I need something very, very wholesome. <laughs> but I mean, E.T. is pretty disturbing in itself. I mean, I was always kind of... It's another film that never quite worked for me. Sorry, Spielberg. But um, I don't know. I think the character of E.T. Yeah, yeah, is very odd looking. But, you know, a great piece of work. Yeah, man. Um, I just I remember watching that when I was when I was a lot younger and being completely freaked out by E.T. Uh, I think it was at the start when he's like going through when they're going through the woods and it's like you see them kind of hobbling about and it might be it must be the moonlight or maybe the light off their their craft or whatever that's kind of lit them up and they're silhouetted almost mm. I vividly remember that when i was a child actually being terrified <laughs> um, yeah i mean so a, 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 a friend of ours was very upset by the scene uh because the men were chasing et which is i think what you're meant to feel <laughs> oh yeah, I, yeah i think he said that he was like leave him alone leave him alone which, uh, oh, I didn't. I didn't even have the 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 the, the sympathy for. for yeah, like you were like, too like, weird looking. <laughs> I was like, this a, like an alien man. I'm like, I'm out yeah. here. I'm not one that. Hopefully, shoot him dead. <laughs> well, I was watching. I was watching a an interview with Mark Kermode or a, a little show where he was talking about possession, and he was saying how much he loved the film, and he wanted to speak to Carlo Rambaldi about it. And this is like at least twenty years after the film came out. And he said, oh yeah, can you tell me about Possession? <laughs> Apparently the guy still wasn't ready to talk about it. He was like, oh, Possession. <laughs> <laughs> and that was basically all he got out of him. Just not ready for it. Oh man. So, I yeah, can imagine. I think the uh, film was probably quite draining for everyone involved. Yeah, it sounds like it. Um, <laughs> and yeah, definitely if you're going to stay with the guy going and <laughs> doing the Wii U-turn, uh, making E.T. and all that kind of the next year. Yeah. Um, I can imagine. Yeah, it is the kind of film where you'll be like one of these things where you just... It didn't have the... I mean, I know it's unsettling, there's a lot of stuff, and I imagine at the time for the people involved in it, it didn't have the same uh, the same vibe for me as like some of the films I've seen that have um, unsettled me to the point where you're like, you know, it, it's like... But like it hits you like hours later at night or something like... You know what I mean? Mm. Or it's just like you feel like, oh, I need a shower or something. It's freshen up, get that right out of your head. It's not yeah. had that effect on me unless it hits me later because I say I only watched it like this morning. But yeah, you probably have a flashback. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, there's actually one of the characters just to briefly kind of go over that we never even spoke about. Um, to this point is uh, I think she's called Marge or Marjorie. Uh, Mar Margit or something like that. Marjorie, yeah. Um, so she's uh, I mean. I don't want to go into it too much because it's complicated enough without adding her into it. Um, but it's quite her whole relationship with Mark and it's a bit insane as well. It's another person that like hates him, wants him to fail, but also seems to have some sort of romantic interest in him. Uh, and it's basically there to sort of look after the child in, in between um, when the teacher's looking after the child. He just turns on. I can understand maybe in that, like you're saying with the misogyny thing, maybe with... Uh, the way he just kind of casts her into being like <laughs> looking after his kid and ba bathing him and shit like that when she like turns up um, yeah but yeah so like that like the marsh her character comes into it and ends up getting killed off so really the the whole point now as well i was gonna you know i think the significance of just mentioning her there is because it's like where sam neil basically starts to to assist or mark sorry starts to assist uh, anna uh, covering up her tracks because presumably she was the one that killed her, so there's another uh, fatality there that she was responsible for. Yeah, um, yeah, I assume that because she's got her throat slit towards the end, right? When she comes out of the the lift, is that right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think it's like, yeah, and then yeah, I assume, it, assume and it's then, Anna who did that. Yeah, and then Mark puts her in the like plastic that he's got and puts her in the car she does make a return later right enough well yeah i mean there's a <laughs> another strangely comedic scene where that car goes flying out the driveway and then the body comes flying out of the boot 
yeah, that was, it's a bit, yeah, bizarre. That whole end sequence in particular, though, is just, I mean, we'll get to that, I guess, pretty soon because it's mm. just, it's, um, yeah, I, I don't know. The, 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 the other bit that was kind of, I kind of I felt like it was another slight comedic moment um, and it, I th- but I don't know how much that, how much it would be. I don't know if it's just because the film is so dark that there's very light, very light relief that's in it. Um, there was a bit as well with like um, hein- when Heinrich's mum was on the phone to Mark, and then there's like a sort of a, a very dry line where it's like she's concerned that Heinrich hasn't come home, and Sam Neil says something about like, oh, what you'd, you'd like something about him being worried about him fucking his wife or something like that. And then she's like, oh, but I made the, I made the fresh bed for them with their sheets. They could have done it here and all this good stuff. <laughs> it's just like, very considerate. Yeah. And each time Neil's just like taking it. Um, yeah, it was just it's things like that. These lines that are just like, yeah, they're just, it's, it's funny, but it's just, you don't, it's just, it's uh, it's unnatural, I guess. Eh? Mm. These got the conversations, the way they would go on and stuff. The whole, yeah, the whole ending just, I mean, I was com- I was confused before. I mean, completely per- perplexed by you know the the end, where um, I don't even know at that point if if maybe you can if you're aware. There's a bit where like obviously uh, Mark's disposing of the body, putting it in the trunk of the car and stuff, and Anna disappears, and then he goes to the um, the the place where she's at, and she's having sex with the octopus man, but. Mm. Where was she going? Did he like? Was she meant to be going to do something different? Was that how? Was that how that was supposed to turn out? I don't really know if there was any clear like point story at that point about mm. what they were actually going to be doing. Yeah, I think things were getting kind of um, murky at that point because when that car reverses and the body falls out, it seems like Anna could be driving that because when you see Mark, he's on the bike, so it's mm-hmm. st- yeah. yeah, it's very unclear what's going on there. Yeah, I think. There's a bit, is there, there's like a bit before that as well with like, it's also on, I mean, it's when he goes to actually physically meet uh, Heinrich's mum and she basically says that she's happy just to die because Heinrich's dead, even though she knew he was dead, <laughs> she's like, she knew he was dead because she saw his body, but she was still worried about him because it's, she'd never seen him, something like she'd never seen his body without his soul, but his soul was still going about or something, <laughs> some extremely strange stuff that was like going on at that point. Um, yeah. I mean, can and we then, just talk about the fact that basically everyone dies? Everyone who comes in contact with this couple dies. Yeah. And yeah, like, I don't know if that's like a theme as well. Maybe it's like the idea that the relationship is so toxic that it's affecting everyone around them as well as just them, you know? And yeah, not just them, sorry. Yeah, totally. Um, I mean, the that is the point I was going to say with like Heinrich's mum. Does she physically die at that point where she takes those pills and lies down? Because it's just like the window just like randomly opens. I didn't know if that was supposed to signify her exit, like. Yeah, I think that was it. Just like she's away, away, her soul's away at the window, like. Um, so yeah, the, then I mean the whole ending, you get the bit where it's it's it's, it's his ex employers that kind of confront him again, eh? Yeah. Mark, and then, I know there was a bit we spoke about uh, previously where we have a little a bit of an appreciation for the stuntmen, the bit you're talking about with the car chase and then he's on the bike. Um, there's a bit before that, sorry, in the car where he's in the back and then you see how the stuntman dives out the car. But then there's the bit on the bike where yeah. he goes absolutely flying. <laughs> and Into a railing. Appear- yeah, and it appears that the stuntman is basically doing cartwheels as he comes off the bike. <laughs> yeah, just he just like- stop, drop and roll. Yeah, it looks <laughs> like he just broke every bone in his body. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, that was what we talked about. I mean, that looked realistic. Whoever yeah, that I, guy, think... I mean, there's no way that guy did not have any a, a single broken bone, like you say. That he definitely broke something doing that stunt. Like, yeah, Zolowski's stayed quite silent on that, as far as did I he... can see. Well, I don't know. I mean, I've not checked, but it's not like he's. Like, oh, by the way, we almost killed this guy. <laughs> yeah, uh, the guy earning his cash, man. Uh, definitely got an appreciation for whoever he was. Um, the uh, after that point, I guess to right to the very end of the film, I guess, and I don't know about exactly what your take is on what actually happened <laughs> because um that was the point where i kind of looked up where um like i was saying at the start when they're on about the guy with the pink socks and then at this point at the very end of the film he he comes you see him going up the stairs with his pink socks on yeah but i know but it's, it's not like i don't know it's not like one of those moments where you're just like ah you're, <laughs> yeah. it, it's, it's more just it like it's just like it <laughs> yeah it's more just like 
all right yeah uh of course but <laughs> you know what i mean it's i don't know i guess but, well the so, thing is they said that 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 guy was their subject meaning yeah. like the one they were spying on yeah yeah so maybe we can kind of piece this together uh well was, that's well that's a why double I, agent or something or well that's what i was kind of wondering because he shoots um obviously like they have their uzis or whatever and like shoot up <laughs> and like shoot them almost dead um <laughs> that's the thing that's i mean the thing that's absolutely insane as well is that like so they get laid like to waste by multiple guys with machine guns but they're not dead didn't see that coming either to be honest yeah yeah exactly um the octopus man is now completed his transformation and is actually sam neil uh with 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 darker eyes <laughs> that's the only yeah. way i can describe him um and i don't know uh, there's actually one scene we never spoke about as well that was also quite um, insane. Was the where, where Anna's character when she goes into the church and she's looking up at Jesus and she's making yeah. extremely strange noises. Mm. <laughs> That's another one I can imagine be quite hard direction. But it's, I mean, man, her performance is insane in that. So uh, um, just the, this is the last thing I was going to say about the octopus spirit because I just found this kind of bold paragraph on this blog it says. An octopus spirit wants you to take natural desires and fulfill them in ways that are out of balance or outside the bounds that the Lord has ordained for them to be fulfilled. Oh man! So it's definitely, definitely what is <laughs> where the guy's coming from on that, like for sure. I just thought it was random, but you've definitely managed to pick up on something. There. Yeah, I don't know what the um, source for this stuff is. Oh, it's okay. There are some links to the Bible here. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. It seems like. Emily Rose Lewis has done a deep dive on the Bible to find references to octopus. With this? Octopuses. Um, yeah. No, it's, uh, it's not to do with this, just generally. I, I was just looking up octopus spirit. And then ah, right, okay. She's found all this. Not directly with the film. Well, no, I mean, no, no. Yeah, but yeah. it seems to tie in. Well, there's a whole, like I say, there's that whole good be evil sort of Christianity vibe in it. So, I mean, pff, the Bible's got some mental stories in it, eh? Like, definitely, definitely. It's got a couple, uh, yeah. I imagine it's got some of that. But um, yeah, so Sam Neill's character, the the, the octopus man, um, is basically a, he is like a demon. You know, he's able just to like he's now going wild and and tells a random woman to sort of kill on his behalf, and she's quite willing to do it to like kill people that are coming up. The stairs. I thought that girl was the same actress who the was, ballet um, one. Yeah, that was being abused in the ballet. Yeah, I thought that too, but then I wasn't quite sure if it was. Um, it looked a lot like her. Yeah, definitely. Uh, maybe it was. I did think that as well. She got to time. have her vengeance. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so even though the, uh, Mark and Anna have been, you know, filled with bullet holes, they're still not dead. And then <laughs> Anna takes the gun and shoots herself basically in the spine, lower back, which thankfully for her sake, kills her. Even yeah, it's kind of weird. I've never sure. seen someone shoot themselves like that in a film. Yeah. I know, and you have to imagine as well that the way that she was lying, that the bullet would have went right through her and probably right through Sam Neill's dick as well. Um, so, Ouch. So, so, yeah. And then he's still not dead. Not no. yet. <laughs> but then takes matters into his own hand by doing a, like a pirouette off the, the top <laughs> floor of that, um, <laughs> off the building or whatever, yeah. to the bottom. So that was pretty insane. And again, yeah. unexpected, because you think, well, he's been, you just assume this guy's going to die because he's been shot about a dozen times at least. Um, yeah, I didn't actually no. pick up on the fact that his eyes were different. I picked up on the fact that one of the things that's different with Anna's doppelganger is the fact that she's got green eyes. Yeah. Because yeah, there's that, even yeah. a credit to the contact lenses. You know, like, yeah. whoever made the contact lenses for that. Yeah, yeah. So her ones, yeah, definitely, man. Her ones are, like, green, uh, the doppelganger, and Sam Neill's ones are, like, dark brown, because I think his eyes are, like, blue or something like that. So it's, like, they're quite, I don't know, just the way they're dark, they kind of look quite demonic or whatever as well in themselves. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much the ending. Is then even the ending? I mean, I thought the film could have ended there. So the doppelganger octopus man flees through the ceiling or something like that onto the roof. Um, and you think, yeah, I thought that was it, but then no, the, the there's still the doppelganger woman teacher and the son. And then that was a bit of a harsh one too, like that the son drowns himself in the bath. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, who knows? He was he was pretty good at holding his breath underwater. He was kind of practicing all the way through the film, wasn't he? Because was he not getting marked to time him and things? Yeah, or but I just assumed that he was <laughs> drowned himself. That he was hiding in the bath. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, because mm. I yeah, 
I mean, that bit was probably one of the most unsettling things in the visually in the film uh, when it's like Sam Neill's. You can kind of see him through the glass door when she's going to answer the door when the kids tell her not to answer the door. Um, yeah. To the, the octopus man, and it's the way he's kind of like standing with his arms, I think like one arm's kind of up and the other one's down, but he's kind of pressed against it, and you can kind of see his features through the door. And it was just, I don't know, yeah, that bit for sure was a bit like, uh, and then it's like the siren that's going off too. Yeah, it sounds like, like that. sounds like he's kind of brought the war with him. Yeah, I think it was supposed to be some sort of a, like reference to that being like a sort of nuclear war, like about everyone's going to go off and die or whatever. So it's um. It was quite a hell of an ending, like even for a film that was insane right through. It got to like it's just kept adding and adding and adding the more and more insanity on it as it went, and it was yeah. already intense from the start. Yeah, I can't imagine what it'd be like to see that in cinema. <laughs> it's probably man. one of those ones where by the end of the film you've still got a full box of popcorn because you've not managed to actually get through it. You're just like <laughs> sitting there with your mouth open, <laughs> holding the first bit right up to your mouth with your mouth wide open. Eh? Imagine um, going on a date or something to that film. Oh man. That would have got a second date for sure, like. Well, it depends. Well, on the bed, yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Maybe someone scares somebody until they don't leave you. Yeah, um, or maybe just people get off on these kind of yeah. int- intellectual horror films. Yeah. So, I mean, looking into it a bit afterwards as well, there was a bit, I guess, that you were talking about there uh, with Isabel and Janney when she was saying um, about the film being the only thing that you can really do when you're younger. As Sam Neill also said, um, it seemed to be that the director made them sink into his own world of darkness and demons. And then now it's like, they, I don't know. They, in fact, there's quite an interesting thing that you're saying, which maybe what you're going on as well with um, the, sort of maybe the, 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 mis, the misogynistic tones or whatever that were in it too. Um, because it was, uh, she said that his movies are, you know, they, they totally focus on women as if they're lilies. Um, but she got bruised inside and out. But she found it exciting to do at the time. Uh, but she doesn't understand how that she basically was ever able to do that. And there was no actress who ever did two films with him. Well, yeah, I mean, I thought some of the themes in the film seem to be, I mean, I think men don't exactly get off light you know, in his eyes. It's like, it seems to be a lot about jealousy, because remember there's the bit where he talks about, um, what, is it, does he say it to Heinrich, he says something about your supreme passion or something like that? Yeah, you know, yeah, that? yeah. And it's like, I, I was so. just thinking along the lines of, I guess, a lot of male insecurity in that sense could be like, if you get left for someone else, then you're sort of like, oh, your ego's like, well, wait a second. Yeah. So she, she, she's getting more from him than she was from me. All right, what, what does that mean exactly? And you're having like a crisis of like, oh, so all our intimate moments maybe didn't really mean anything because now she's having even more intimate moments with this other person, you know? Yeah, because he says something in the film too about how he used to be scared of him or something, eh? Uh, yeah, for, yeah. For a time or something, then he's but then he's not scared of him like afterwards, but presumably because she's not just loyal to him, basically, I guess. And I can't remember if it's Anna or Helen who says the thing about... It's something about like sharing a partner or something like that. Do you remember um, that bit? There's some sort of dialogue about like allowing someone to be with someone else. I can't remember that bit, man. Did you yeah, see that? it's just a lot of the dialogue's delivered in quite a quick way. You know, it's you know they oh, sort it's... of reel off a lot of the lines, but it was just a thing I picked up on because maybe it's one of these things that um you know going back to the possession title. Yeah, I don't know. It's an idea I think about a lot. You know, this idea of like you know people talk about like true love, and it's like oh, you're with someone forever and ever. But then there's also like a dark side to that. You know, like saying someone that belongs to you forever. You know, it's a bit yeah. disturbing. Yeah. If totally you look right. at it through a certain lens, I remember say anything had that song called Property, where it's about a guy who's essentially saying that the woman is his property. Yeah. And it's um yeah, it's just an interesting thing to think about because people always think about the positive. I'm going to be in love with this person forever and we'll stay together and we'll never be with anyone else. Yeah, yeah, totally, man. I guess there's a bit of a thing changing in recent times, uh, more so anyway, um, where there is more of a focus on that sort of thing. With Polyamory. Um, well, yeah, that, but I mean, even just in a, a more, um, like, just with sort of more an independent way where, like, women wouldn't even take 
the guy's surname or whatever because that's sort of I mean like as you say like the property thing as well yeah. like you're now called my name i know mm. you're you're my wife kind of thing um but it's yeah it's it's interesting for sure like um one of the things that this was i guess i kind of found it interesting a sight away from that topic um is that the film didn't actually get approved in the uk to actually come out till 1999 which you know was like yesterday to me you know what i mean yeah <laughs> considering it was in like 22 years ago but yeah <laughs> yeah no, i mean no but from 1999 when it came out in 1981 um obviously it was like one of the video nasties that we had yeah um and the from the uh, during the 80s and all that kind of stuff but it got approved in in, in 1999 but in germany where it's actually set it didn't get approved for release until 2009 wow which which was pretty insane to me as well i thought yeah. they i thought they would have been more willing to release it you know even before the uk was mm. um it seemed to be heavily heavily edited where it was re released too uh, i think in america it had really really a hard time that's why i wasn't sure where it says it made like a million at the box office but it had us only figures or something mm. but then it didn't seem like it had been released there because it was banned for so long <laughs> and then when right. it was released i think it was only you know there was 45 minutes taken off the film which would totally change the film, I imagine, and make it even more confusing or something. You know yeah, I mean? when I was researching online, you can actually find the VHS cut, which is, yeah, something like 80 or 90 minutes. Yeah, because I think this one was just over two hours, eh? About two hours yeah, five exactly. or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, I mean, man. There's a lot to cram in, you know? Oh, you need man. that runtime. It didn't feel like two hours, though. Like, you know what I mean? It was, it was, I mean, I don't know if it was just, it was hard, it was hard to follow, but it was you were locked in on it you know what i mean it passed pretty quick yeah because you didn't know what the hell was coming at you next yeah man um i actually found that that bit i was trying to look for before where i was saying about uh, isabella Gianni as well um so she won Bex the best actress award at the Cannes Cannes film festival in 1981 mm. for a performance in this and also um in a, a james ivory sorry james ivory's uh production of quartet i've never seen okay. that um but yeah, so she stated um, that in one of her interviews that it took her several years to actually recover from possession and said that she would never take on a similar role. Um, and it was also rumoured that she attempted suicide after filming had completed, which was later Jesus. confirmed by uh, Zolaski. I don't know. I've been on some slightly intense film sets, but nothing like that. Oh, man, I, I know. But you get this, eh? There's like there's so many films that seem to have like taken their toll on people's sanity that you have it like rumored afterwards and stuff, eh? Mm. Um, particularly in like horror films, obviously, like we keep saying about like The Shining and stuff with Shelley Duvall. Um, I think it was like the girl who played like Reagan in The Exorcist was she not meant to have had a bit of a had a bit of a, a hard time mm. after, after that as well? Maybe, maybe after. Apparently, she enjoyed being on it because the director was really kind to her. But I, I don't know. Maybe it was something to do with the the makeup. Maybe oh, that yeah. that got a bit overbearing after. Oh, I, I could yeah. imagine. Like there was also a bit actually in The Exorcist, um, just to go as an aside there, um, where you know there's a bit in the bed where she's like going up and down, like f basically like going up and down. And it's like yeah, she's, yeah. she's shouting like make it stop, make it stop or something like that. That was actually genuine because they put like an animatronic thing on her to make her like go flying up and back down again, but she kind of came loose from it, so she wasn't properly fast fastened in, and I think it actually broke a part of her spine, or mm, or something like doing that. I think whether was that not? I thought it was the who played the mother, was that Ellen Burstein or something like that. Oh, was it the mother that, that happened to? I think it's the bit where she goes flying across the room, like they yanked ah. the thing really hard. It really messed up her spine. Oh, right, I thought it was to the actual to the wee girl. You might be right there, I need to look into that one as well. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, either or. Jesus Christ, man, you know what I mean? It's all not good. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I mean, in terms of the way that the film's sort of been received afterwards as well, it's obviously, I mean, it's considered a masterpiece. Um, I've got a good quote here too that says, it's a film that dis defies easy categorization, which I would wholeheartedly agree with. Um, it combines elements of espionage, thriller, relationship drama and creature feature to concoct one of the most blistering, bonkers and unhinged films about divorce ever made. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I I mean, what, what, what's the moral of this film? It's like, don't get married. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh man, it's just... I mean, it's funny to think too, because the whole thing with the divorce, I didn't really... 
uh, walk on to that as the main crux of the story for, no. for large for large parts of it. But when that you was almost boil like it, a punchline the way they delivered that. Yeah, man. I mean, but I guess when you boil it down to the like to the actual what's actually going on there, isn't it? Divorce is pretty much what it comes down to, um, mm. partially anyway. Um, so nah, man. I mean, I thought it was really good. I kind of at the time, as I say, I feel like you need to be in a specific mood probably to watch this one. Um, I would. I wouldn't say I was in the mood when I watched it earlier. That I, I mean, I loved it at the time. I was like thinking, "Ah, oh, this is like a six out of ten film or something." But then when I actually thought about it afterwards, I'll I'll bump that up to be a little bit better to a seven out of ten, um, because it's maybe a little bit too harsh on it. Because it is even just discussing it with you now that you know what I mean, man. It's 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 something that's it's obviously a, it's an art it's an artistic piece. You know what I mean? It's it's definitely it's unique to cinema, um, and. I mean, the performances in it alone uh, are just incredible. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, it's um, it's pretty unique in terms of a horror film. I guess I saw there's arguments about what genre it actually fits into, but that's usually a sign of a good film. Yeah, I mean, we've had this conversation a couple of times as well with the things we've picked, that if they do fit quite into horror. But this one seems to be... And I mean, it's easy to... Um, I mean, more so than like Four Flies on Grey Velvet for sure, with just the whole, I mean, that thing, the octopus thing in it and stuff too, and the violence, it definitely, it's definitely, I, I would say it definitely fits into like the horror thing. Uh, maybe not the conventional slashers and all these kind of things, but uh, it's, 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 it's psychologically, it's there. That's why I, I think there's, um, you know, when you get the, the more modern films like Midsommar and stuff as well, I imagine... Um, those guys would be taking a bit of inspiration from things like this that would go back and watch. Yeah, I guess like um, when you're going down the more like psychological route where it's more about, I don't know, sustained takes, you know, um, just la uh, staying on an actor's face for a long time and just letting the emotion play. I mean, yeah, there's there's a lot of that going on now. Yeah, man. I mean, sometimes even when it's like quite a sinister thing, but they've got almost a smile on their face, you know what I mean? It's That's the thing that like gets you. And I guess in terms of just thinking about it there too, we were talking about this film being specifically focusing on like the horrors involving relationships. Midsommar is exactly that as well, isn't it really? With the girl and her boyfriend. I've actually not um, seen it yet, so... Oh, have you not seen it yet? Nah. No, that's worth watching. That's one of the ones that left me where I was like, Jesus, <laughs> I got away from that. Uh, that Bless definitely really. left me feel, uh, kept me made, made me feel a bit unsettled. Some of the stuff that's in that film, for sure, man, amazing, amazing film. Definitely check it out. Like, but yeah, there was one um, technical film I really liked in Possession. A technical thing, sorry, I liked in Possession, where it was, um, you know, when Mark receives that film of uh, the ballet class. Yeah, and then it's just interesting because it's that like he's watching it, but then suddenly we're in that scene. Yeah, that I was a bit, really good. Yeah, man, that bit was like the bit. I think the first time was just kind of like looking down the lens of the camera as well. But I thought, well, it's because they're filming the ballet scene or whatever for the video. But then it's like the way that it cuts, because it's not natural. You know what I mean? It's like there is two different cameras there. And then I think after that, she even looks down the camera as well. But yeah, you get totally caught up on that scene, eh? Where you don't feel like, like you're saying, when you're in the video. And then at the end, when it comes back out of it and you see Sam Neill watching it, kind of perplexed almost. Um they kind of you kind of go oh yeah they, they, you kind of remember that that's what you you kind of get you get totally sucked right into it's it. a film within a film where sam neil finally feels like the audience of possession <laughs> yeah man. um but yeah i mean i i really enjoyed it i think it's definitely worth one that's i don't was it how did you come across this film actually because it's not one that i particularly had heard of it came up it's kind of come up over the years in different blogs and things that i've looked at i saw um there was a, a video done, it was all about film editing, and it was using scenes from that, particularly that scene I mentioned before with the two really intense close-ups and how they cut between them. Oh, and yeah. Um, yeah, I was just always interested to see it, because that video must have come out like six years ago or something. So yeah, when we started doing this, I was like, yeah, that could be one for the for the podcast. Yeah, man. Um, yeah, hopefully some people listening have seen it, and uh, if not, they should. Yeah, definitely. It's not a particularly easy one to find, I guess, but um, it's. I, well, I suppose. Well, I suppose you can. I've had a couple of issues with some of the films, but um, it's definitely worth checking out, hundred percent. And how would you rate it? I'm giving it a seven, as I say. Yeah, I mean, I think probably plot wise would probably be like seven, seven point five, but I'll give it a ten for originality. 
yeah, you're not going to get anything more original than this if you, this year anyway. <laughs> you're watching. Uh, yeah, pr- I think definitely my favorite Sam Neill film so far. And his mate. And oh, and, yeah. and Steven Spielberg's by the looks of things. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I thought everyone else definitely check it out. Thanks again for listening to the podcast, and we'll all be with you again next month. Thanks everyone for joining us again on the podcast. Next month we'll be diving into the vaults of Hammer Horror. But until then,